Okay. So uh, we'll come back uh, to this. Okay. So uh, I noted Ethica software that allows researchers to collect and analyze data on human behaviors, attitudes, beliefs, and exposures using these platforms, okay? Um, and uh, we're going to be seeing how we build the study, uh, how we build studies that are study specific, um, that are, that are whose, whose designs differ largely from one study for another for deployment to participant smartphones and the web-based interface, and indeed to collect data from wearables. So what I'm going to do in order to support this is to go view the researcher side of Ethica. We've just seen the participant side with the phones. We'll now be focusing on the researcher side, okay? So to do this, I'm going to go over and call up a browser and uh, I will go to ethicadata.com slash dashboard, okay? I will remind you that prior to having done this, you should make sure that you sign up for a researcher account here. Um, we've already used your participant account. Here you'll be using your researcher account, okay? Which had that separate email associated with it. So I'm gonna go to the researcher dashboard and it's going to log me in uh, immediately for you. It may ask for your uh, researcher password uh, so that you can log in. Um, tell me if you have uh, any, um, once you're, if you have any slowdown in getting to this point. Have you gotten into the researcher dashboard yet? Oh, okay. So uh, we won't have a study yet. Just do cancel for now. We're going to be creating a study right now. Okay. But um, the, um, yes, yeah, so, so we'll be doing joining a study in a minute. Okay. So you're in the, this, this is the researcher account. And, and were you able to get it? Okay. Terrific. And your name's? Jason. Jason? Rayhan. Thank you. Um, so, the Ethica um, dashboard for, uh, for researchers um, will also differ from researcher to researcher in its details because some researchers are, so, are new to the system, just creating their first study. Some researchers have many studies associated with them, okay? Um, but we're going to go through a process by which we're going to build up a study, define a study, configure a study, okay? As I had noted earlier, that process is undertaken in a declarative fashion. It's undertaken in a specification fashion, a fashion that doesn't require programming. So in the researcher dashboard, in the upper left, you should see a button that says create study. Do you see that? Okay, um, great. Um, so I'd like you to press that, that button, okay? Now, you're welcome to follow this through with me but I'm going to need to create a study with a different name from you. Okay. So I don't, I don't want our studies clashing. So um, you're welcome to name your study anything you'd like. Um, I will name mine um, uh, SBP uh, Tutorial um, uh, 2019, okay? Um, and I'm going to provide a, uh, a brief consent form, okay? so. Um, uh, so I'm going to say this is a placeholder um, set of text for the consent form, which would uh, typically help educate um, educate a per a potential participant um, uh, about the characteristics, uh, responsibilities, and uh, risks associated with the study. Right. Um, and uh, typically the consent form is something we take very carefully. We, we run it through our, um, uh, inter in, uh, our institutional review board or research ethics board. And, um, and it may include multimedia content. It may include links to videos, for example, where it's provided in a more, in a richer way. It may include, um, uh, test evaluation instruments in a more sophisticated way that might test um, 
uh, whether a, a, a participant has, has really understood the material. That would be a more complex design um, here. And we specify the, uh, the university associated with, and I said next, okay? Now, again, please use a different name than mine so ours don't clash, okay? Um, okay, the study period. So we specify for Ethica um, uh, study designs. Ethica allows the definition of studies that have very different characteristics. Some are panel studies. Um, extending over long periods of time where there's rolling admission over the years. Others follow cohorts initiated at the same time and they followed for exactly the same time. Uh, yet others might involve um, only episodic recruitment. So I'm going to set this study up to go from July 9th to July 16th. I could also set it to be open-ended, in which case there's no real um, end time for the study. I'll, I'll set it to, to be a defined, um, defined date. And separate from the study duration, the duration of the whole study, there's the question of how long are participants in it. Sometimes they're the same, in which case I can select that, and sometimes they're different. Maybe each participant is in this study, say, for three days. Okay? Um, uh, it, the study is a whole run here, but well, they can be in it for a shorter time. And maybe I'm shooting for, well, Ethica has been used by thousands of participants in some studies and, you know, very small numbers in others, uh, such as ground truth collection. Um, I'll, I'll shoot this one between an extremely small study uh, with 10 participants. And then there's the question, how do we, how do we invite people, okay? Um, uh, is it public? Is it invitation-based, et cetera, okay? Um, so I'm going to just say next here. Um, do you need anything clarified or a bit more time? Mm -hmm. Sure. It's the researcher account you'll want to log into Ethica, yeah. Yeah, so that's a good point. There's a researcher ID and a participant ID. So here we can see researchers and when you log into Ethica dashboard, it's as a researcher in your capacity as a researcher, which needs to be with the researcher email. Okay, so it's your researcher email. And generally, when people sign up, I like to encourage using uh, work emails just so you can keep them um, keep them separate, right? This was something covered before you came in a little bit, so yeah. So tell me when you're um, when you're set. Appreciate your your helping with that. Were you able to, um, okay, great, great. And you can parameterize the study as you see fit in that next, um, that next. It doesn't have to follow my design or any of the details, okay? Uh, so we can always go back here. Uh, enrollment type, um, I said public, okay? But um, if we wanted it to be invitation-based, that we want to um, have only invited people be, um, uh, be included, we, can, we could indicate that, okay? Okay, and then I said next, and I'm at the, uh, I'm at the data source. Uh, are, you, are you there? Yeah, uh, I no, I said I said three days, but it, you know you it, you can use as you see fit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
So I said next, and here's where I can add a data source, okay? Now, um, once again, Ethica supports a wide variety of data sources. I had noted earlier that, um, you know, there's, uh, there's broad types of data um, that can be collected, including, um, including from wearables, um, as well as these five types from the, the phone itself. Um, we're going to just pick certain certain ones right now, okay? Um, so specifically, uh, I'm going to have a study where I imagine that I'm interested in tick-borne illness. So I'm going to set it up with some data related to location, specifically GPS. This is for outdoor, and so GPS is a, is a good measure. I'll say um, it's mandatory participants to really participate, they need to have GPS. So I added that as a data source. So for this particular study, uh, participants um, to participate would need to offer GPS. I'm also interested in aspects of how physically active they are. If they're um, very physically active, it might give some understanding about risk factors um, uh, for it, um, the ways in which that affects infection. So I'm going to look and there should be a, a motion here and I'm going to do pedometer. It's in the motion area, okay? Um, and I'm saying pedometer and I'll say no, that's less critical, so I'll say it's not mandatory, okay? Uh, so someone could decline and still be in the study um, for that. Um, next, uh, I am going to select the one at the way in the bottom, which is survey responses, and I'll add that. And often we add one for analysis purposes. It's not required, but battery, which is, it's, it's something which is quite innocuous. It's collected in the background, and it can alert us if participants' phones, for some reason, are, are running low in power. But... It also is something that's reliably connected if their phone is, is collecting data. And so for a number of studies, we actually tend to include battery, okay? But it's not a required thing, okay? Um, okay. Um, now, uh, what I'm going to do is, um, is say next here, and we can specify a few other things. For example, um, uh, do we want to nudge them if, if, if we haven't gotten data from them for a while? Do we want to restrict it to only upload via Wi-Fi? Uh, and do we want a custom image associated with it? Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to say uh, create study here. And you'll notice when it creates it, it, it did create it. Um, it's been created successfully, but it asked me, do I want to populate survey instruments for the study? Because I did indicate that I wanted surveys, but I haven't yet set them up. And uh, I say, yes, take me there, okay? So now you'll notice over on the left-hand side here in this kind of accordion menu, I have an SBP tutorial one here, and um, I'm, I'm editing that right now. And I'm going to say, add a new survey, okay? Um, and it's going to, Give me the option of, of creating a survey, okay? Um, now, surveys come, as we said earlier, in many, many particular uh, forms, okay? Um, so these include uh, uh, surveys that are at a, at a time of their choosing, like with buttons, those that are triggered at a certain time, okay? Um, and uh, those that are triggered by context, such as triggered by proximity to your prosthetic limb or to, uh, to your child or to, uh, to a, um, an object like uh, used by uh, within the, um, the workplace. We're going to set up a survey here, however, that's particularly simple. Um, uh, and it's almost universally used across studies, which is a baseline survey, an entry survey. It's a survey you'll fill out when you enter a study. Okay, um, and these baseline surveys um, will ask, as is typical, for a bit of demographic information. Okay, so this is going to be a baseline survey. Um, triggering logic here 
I'm just going to say that it's a um, uh, it's it's a survey which uh, it's not. It's not an eligibility survey. Uh, it it's, um, could be time-based. It could be proximity-based. Um, uh, it could be user-triggered um, or, or, or another, or a dropout survey, okay? Um, but uh, here, we're going to keep it as, uh, and let's, let's say I'll say a, a time-based um, Time based survey, okay? And I'll set the base time to be based on the study registration date, okay? So that's when they enter. It's a baseline survey, meaning as soon as they enter it, it will be, um, be triggered, okay? Um, and this is the base time, and I'll say it's triggered on their first day um, between uh, these, um, between certain times, okay? And I'll set it to go off uh, within their first day between 9 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. Okay? Um, okay? And uh, I, I won't repeat it. It's, a, it's a once a time. And there'll be no criteria for it. This is uh, issued for all. Okay? Um, okay. Um, great. So uh, having done this, um, uh, I'm going to then add it, okay? Um, and uh, that survey would then be used when, um, uh, would then be triggered within a participant's first day, okay? Um, and uh, here, uh, it's asking me, how do I wanna notify people if a survey is waiting? Do I want to do so in the app or, um, uh, or uh, in a uh, email message will be another option coming shortly or in an SMS message, okay? Um, so we can have an in-app notification and it can say, please fill out your study entry survey, okay? Um, and um, uh, this uh, survey, collects uh, collects some basic uh, background information and we can say add okay um, now uh, surveys can also be associated with expiration times um, never expire or expires after a, a certain amount of time so if you don't answer a survey after a certain amount of time we can make it expire here we'll keep it never expiring okay um, so however long, because this is an entry survey, we want to, um, uh, we want to uh, trigger it uh, and keep it triggered, uh, keep it there. Now, um, I, I will just uh, note here that um, there's a few other options here when it comes to selecting the base time or the date. This is basically saying the date as a whole is the first day versus the registration time of day, okay? Um, and uh, we can also uh, trigger it, for example, at very particular times um, relative, say, to the registration time, okay? Um, so there's some, uh, uh, some sophisticated settings that you can use associated with this, okay? Um, so having defined these components, however, I haven't yet set the, the, the contents of the survey, and we're going to, um, to engage in that right now, okay? So um, uh, in order to do that, we need to define the, um, uh, the, the, the real uh, study questions associated with it. One other um, component here that I'll just highlight is with the survey, you can uh, indicate, do you want it to show, um, show progress in filling it out? Um, uh, do you want to display a participant's responses? And critically, do we want to capture the location? Okay, um, uh, so here we can actually say when the survey is submitted, should it geostamp, okay? Um, uh, and, 
And this allows us to basically, even if we're not collecting GPS uh, information for the study as a whole, we can geostamp where a given survey is, um, uh, is, is uh, been filled out by selecting capture location. Show progress shows the progress along as you do it. If it's multiple pages, um, uh, it will basically um, uh, track and say you're on page one of 12 or two of 12. And that sometimes gives, um, uh, gives a sense of uh, where, how much further one has to do, how one has to go within the survey, okay? Um, okay, so uh, beyond that, we're going to have questions associated with the survey. These are questions that we're gonna to use to populate the survey with content. Okay, um, and so for the question flow here, for this baseline survey, um, we're going to uh, we're going to set up just a few basic questions, but ones that will illustrate the ways in which Ethica is used. So first of all, I'm going to add a question which will ask them for their current age. So I'm going to drag over from this palette a question type here. Okay. Um, which will be, uh, please uh, enter your age in years, okay? And you'll notice when we, um, uh, when we fill that out, uh, we can specify the contents, uh, including, including videos, et cetera. But we can also, over here on the, the right-hand side, set, for example, minima and maximum. So, for example, we can set it to be from 18 years to be uh, for 100 years as the maximum, okay? And that allows, um, allows a person to specify it within a certain range, okay? Um, so that will be one question. We will also ask to specify a person's height, okay? So dragging this over, please uh, enter your height uh, in units of your choice, okay? And that's going to be a length question, okay? Um, <clears throat> and uh, they're going to be able to specify what units they use. The default unit here is centimeters. We could set it to be feet and inches, but they can always choose a different unit, okay? And it will convert it appropriately. Finally, we're going to go uh, add a question associated with their weight. And in a similar fashion, we can drag over from the left-hand side, please uh, enter your weight. And I'll skip saying um, uh, in a unit of your choice, okay? Um, and uh, here we go. Um, great. Um, and uh, here we'll set the default to be pounds, but they can use uh, kilograms. We have a, a survey defined up here, um, the default question, which I'm gonna eliminate, okay? So here we go. Enter your age and years, your height and your weight, okay? And I'm going to save, and I'm going to validate this. And it says, okay, everything is fine with this survey, okay? Um, and uh, I can then publish it, okay? Publishing it, It'll ask, okay, who do I send this to? Is it all currently enrolled participants or only certain ones? I'm just going to say, say all, okay? So if you have a new survey that's for an ongoing study, you can push it out there. And you can push it out to subsets of people or to everyone, okay? Um, so, so this allows for uh, delivering content, disseminating content, uh, to, uh, to study participants, okay? Um, so this was one questionnaire. And uh, you'll notice that uh, I set up the, the questions here in a fashion that, um, uh, that, that supported uh, uh, multiple units and uh, in that sense uh, also supported some common things within the health sphere. 
having defined the survey, you'll notice it's assigned a number. We'll come back to that, okay, um, at a later time. Uh, and you'll notice that we can also release it um, at a specific time into per particular participants. Uh, we can also duplicate it, or we could go back and edit it, okay? Uh, here, you'll notice that uh, it says it's user triggered. I'm going to go back and edit it. I actually don't want don't want to have a user triggered survey. Okay, so I'm going to eliminate that user triggered one uh, so that it's only time triggered. Okay, um, and uh, I'm I'm just going to keep the triggering logic we used. Uh, I chose do it to all participants, okay? Okay. Okay, so um, here I'm going to publish it again, and we're going to say publish it. Okay, great. So we just set up one study to be issued on the first day a study, a participant is registered at a number of different times, okay? Um, uh, so uh, I'd like now to continue on uh, our walkthrough, and I'd like you to use that app you installed to opt into this study. Now, in order to, to do that, we're going to need a study ID. So if you go to the Ethica app, okay, um, and I'll again broadcast mine so you can see it here um, with the screencast, I'm going to start broadcasting, and I'm going to go to the Ethica uh, app uh, interface here and I'm going to opt into this study but I do that with this menu up here and I can say join study or when you join Ethica it will ask you directly okay and it's asking me to join a study and it's asking which study do I want to join enter your registration code the study ID okay in order to find that out, what's my study ID? What I need to do is to go here and go to the basics associated with the study, and you'll find this is study 800 that I've just set up. So I can go enter here study 800 and say find, and you'll notice oh, that it provides, it, it indicates this, and you'll notice this text. This is the, the text that I wrote, right? Um, and it indicates, moreover, the different sort of data collection, um, uh, data collection, the data sources associated with it, and the sponsor, etc. So I'm going to say go ahead and register, okay? And it will enroll me in the study. Now it's notable that that um, most studies don't, or a great many studies don't have participants enter with that. They instead provide them a link, for example, a URL, which by clicking on it will, will enroll them in it, um, or they'll, they'll um, uh, go through and, and, and help them enroll in another way. Another way is to have a QR code uh, that's associated with the study, which will allow them to opt in. But we've just seen a way that we could opt into a study. And having opted in, we can see this interface, okay? And you'll notice that there's this study interface that provides this information, okay? Okay, so we've just seen closing that loop associated with we created a study and now we're in the study. And, and at some point within this day, I'll have a study, um, a survey to complete that will be issued. We said issue it at a random time between 9 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. So we might expect that there'll, there'll be a survey later today, okay? However, I want to go on and show some additional components of this, okay? Um, so for that, um, I am going to uh, go temporarily stop, uh, stop broadcasting here. And I want to go back and explore some more on the study design side, okay? Um, great. So uh, next, uh, what I'd like to do is to 
set up a um, uh, a study uh, or a survey which will allow people to report a tick that they found on themselves, okay? And uh, this will basically uh, set up a, uh, a survey that can be triggered by the participant, okay? Um, so to do this, uh, we're going to go back to the Ethica interface as researchers, and we are going to go to surveys, and we're going to set up a new survey. And this is going to be a survey called Report Tick, okay? Um, here we go. Report Tick, okay? Now this Report Tick survey is going to be different than the last one. Instead of being triggered, triggered by time, it's going to be triggered by the user. And the user will have a button that says to them, um, uh, I, I found a tick, okay? Uh, and there's going to be no criteria associated with it, okay? Um, and uh, it, it looks like there's already a, a one there that was there before, so I'm going to eliminate it. So participants can start the study by tapping on I found a tick button, okay? And uh, here, um, we're not going to have any notification. Um, they're notifying it right away. We do want to capture their location, right? When they say they found a tick, we want to know where they are, if possible. And so we will capture their location, okay? Um, in order to set up the questions, we'll go to this questions flow tab. And uh, I am going to, to go and set up a survey which basically um, ask them a few questions. So the first question would be um, uh, uh, in what so uh, in what types of protective behavior um, I'll say which of the following types of personal protective behavior uh, have you been practicing um, uh, today. Okay, um, this is an information question. I didn't actually mean to do it. I wanted to drag a question which is a multiple response question, a multiple answer question. Okay, so I, I made the mistake of typing here. I, I should delete that and I'll put my question text here. Which of the following types of personal protective behavior you've been practicing today? So I dragged in this multiple choice. Okay. Uh, it's called multiple choice. A better answer, a better one would be multiple answer. Okay, so um, I'll say uh, wearing long sleeves, uh, wearing long pants, um, uh, tucking the end of my pants into my socks. Um, uh, so uh, wearing a hat. And uh, uh, and uh, you know avoiding contact with vegetation, uh, vegetation and tall grasses, and um, and then finally I'll have a I'll have one that's um, uh, that's other, okay. Okay, now. These are different types of answers which someone could uh, could make. Okay, the other one, the other answer, is uh, is one that we want to elicit more information. Okay, and we'll be coming back to that uh, in a little bit. Okay, but um, for now we'll we'll have this. Um, next, we're going to take unique advantage of the phone by dragging in a question that's going to be, ooh, excuse me, I didn't mean to do that first, a single choice. So in other words, a single answer question, yes or no. Um, could you take uh, a photo of the tick, of the tick? And we will either say yes, or we will say no, okay?
Okay. Um, great. Um, and um, and then we want to allow them to take a photo of the tick. So this is a question that they'll answer. And then we want to drag in an image question. And here, please take a photo of the tick from approximately 10 centimeters away, being sure to show the top of the tick's body, right? Uh, so this is giving a bit of guidance on the photo, okay? Um, um, so um, I'm going to allow them to do that, but you'll notice that we have a bit of a challenge here, right? Uh, because here, we only want this question to be asked what? Anyone? Oh, this question that we're having with the photo. We only want it to be asked, um, asked under what condition? Well, if they answered yes with respect to this one, right? Um, otherwise, we want it uh, to be uh, to be not asked, right? So there's two ways to do this in Ethica, and we'll we'll experiment with both ways. The first thing is to take this question, okay, and by default, we're selecting it, make it unclick enabled. So by default, it will not be enabled, okay. We okay with that? And then if we go up to the yes here, we can say enable question, okay? And um, if yes is pressed, we're going to enable question five, okay? So only if yes is pressed. I'm selecting the yes enter entry and um, and then only if that is selected, will I enable question five? Otherwise, question five is going to be disabled, okay? Okay. Um, yeah, um, there we go. Okay. Um, okay. Are we okay with this? So I'm going to validate now, and it said everything looks good. And now I'm going to publish, okay? And now there's a difference from before because you folks are, we're all in the study, okay? So here, we're, we're in the study. And if I go to my Ethica app, okay? Um, now it actually shows, I don't know if you can see it on yours, right? Um, it actually shows a, a, a button. Do you see that on yours? So I'm going to screencast mine here and um, we'll go, uh, go back to Ethica here. And uh, there we go. And what I'll see is something like like this, right? Um, okay. For some reason, the, the screencasting is is uh, is showing. Uh, it's it's taking a bit of extra time. Here we are. There we go. Okay, and there we go. So you should see something like this with a button there. Did you see that or not yet? Okay, so let's try to see why. Uh, I suspect what's going to happen is the following. So if we go back to the interface, if you're seeing multiple such buttons, um, I'm just going to go back here, okay? Um, and I will look at the survey definitions I will go here, I'll open up this survey, and I will say, first of all, you should check, 
is the triggering logic for your baseline survey, is that time triggered only or time and user triggered? Okay, so if you still have user triggered, I actually went and deleted the user trigger component. So if, if you go here and you do edit, this should only say time. There's probably a user trigger and you'll do an X next to it because the baseline um, we're imagining here, we only want to trigger it um, for the, um, uh, via the time, okay? Um, yeah, um, okay. Um, okay. Uh, Great. Um, so does that make sense? Uh, and secondly, probably similarly, you may have a, um, uh, a several user triggered things here. If you look at the second one and you do edit, perhaps you have more than one user triggered thing here um, for the second survey. Do you have... Uh, yeah, so you'll want to get rid of the one that doesn't have the right caption because when you create a survey, it has by default a user trigger thing, which um, we, we don't want, okay? So those will account for at least a total of three. Um, not, not, not sure about the, the fourth, okay? Um, okay, um, uh, so um, there we go. Uh, so... Now we have uh, two surveys, one of which is a baseline that goes off at random times during the day, um, in the first day. Another is a push button. Do you see that push button on yours? Okay. So if you push that button, you'll see a survey now, right? Um, I'll switch back to um, this uh, interface. This is what you'll see, right? And so I might for example, say I'm wearing a hat, um, I'm avoiding contact, and then it's going to ask, can I take a photo of the tick, right? And I'll say yes, and you notice then it says, please take a photo. But if I said no, there's no question visible below it. Do you see that? So I'm going to say yes, and, I, and, and here it allows me to take a photo or to select a photo from my gallery. I'm going to say take a photo, and I will take a photo of the offending tick. Okay, there we go, and uh, and I'm going to submit it, and it's telling me I have more surveys from from other things. But I just submitted that that photo, right? Um, so we've accomplished um, uh, something that make you know putting in place a survey which makes use of the unique features of the phone in terms of, uh, of, of uh, rich audiovisual components. But it also is going to, um, it also has triggering, as logic to trigger things at different times of the day or through user response. And moreover, has uh, skip patterns or conditional logic within a survey to enable or disable things, right? Um, and uh, what we've seen is that um, uh, we can configure that without programming here within this interface. Now, I'd like to go back now to examine things from the perspective of, um, of, of the researcher, though. So uh, you'll recall that uh, we built this uh, study here in, in, from a researcher perspective. And if we go now to this different part of the interface, we go to the surveys and responses. We can view data from all responses, all surveys, and do display uh, responses. And we'll actually see, for example, what I submitted earlier. These are, are, are my responses, okay? Um, for you, if you have your own study, you would see presumably your responses, okay? Um, and, uh, and you could uh, appropriately, um, appropriately include uh, uh, responses to that uh, from, your, uh, from your phones, okay? Um, so this is a, uh, an area of the site that's uh, very typically used. 
and uh, which includes uh, a, a easy capacity to track from either a particular participant basis. For example, I can track it from the sole participant here or from all participants and can select different, uh, different surveys appropriately. Okay. I could also look only at baseline survey. And you notice it tells me the time, my responses, includes the, these uh, pictures, it can include audio uh, or, uh, or, or multimedia um, links from, from the study as well. Okay, um, so Ethica provides an interface for browsing data and for monitoring adherence, okay? so. Um, Beyond this, we can actually use the Ethica interface uh, to, to monitor the adherence associated with a given study. So for example, for this participant, I can look, for example, at, at their participation, the survey responses, the availability of GPS data associated with it, and uh, get a sense of their involvement. I can also look at what are called survey sessions which basically indicate um, for one or more participants, for one or more surveys, uh, for certain ranges of dates, here just, um, uh, just over the next few days, we can go look and we can see when are their surveys due to be delivered. So these were three that I filled out with that button. You'll notice this one is scheduled to be delivered uh, actually today, uh, later today, um, uh, excuse me, this is uh, within the first day of participation. So it's actually scheduled to go off tomorrow at 10, 11 a.m., okay? It has to fall within that time window I specified, but it's within the, the, day, after, um, uh, the day after enrollment. And you'll notice uh, this is indicating sort of how many that I've actually filled out versus, uh, I don't have any examples, but I could let them expire or in fact cancel them, okay? So uh, if, I, if I were to go and, for example, call this up and then just cancel it, and I'll say um, I wanna cancel it uh, here, and I go and I upload it, um, I could actually see, okay, there are some canceled surveys in addition to some that were filled out, okay? Um, so uh, here we go, and uh, there we go, okay. Um, and I'll, I'll go and, and there we go. This was uh, a canceled survey. I just canceled that, and we could see it reflected. So monitoring adherence, monitoring who's submitting surveys and what are in the surveys is very valuable. Um, it's also valuable to download um, data often um, in order to, um, uh, to, to be able to inspect it. And we'll come back to that in a second. But before that, I want to go and I want to modify that survey. And this partly communicates how using surveys, we, can, um, we have a very flexible tool to allow them to be updated. So if we go to the design and surveys component, and we go to the report tick survey, we can go back and edit it, okay? And here in the questions flow area, remember we have this other question? And we didn't really have a way of capturing that, but now we know how to, okay? Um, and um, we can do so in one of two ways. One way is we could drag over a response that allows them to indicate it and only enable that response if they select this, right? We did this with yes, we enabled that, right? And that would be an easy thing to do, but I'm gonna show you another way to enable conditional content, okay? Um, and specifically, it's through the use of pages. So here I'm going to add a new page to the survey. Pages allow a particularly flexible mechanism for conditional content without the need to show the user content that, um, uh, that is to be disabled. So um, often when we have hidden questions, uh, some, in, in some versions of Ethica, I think it's still true, the questions were grayed out and they'd only be 
to show if, if the requisite um, uh, conditions are met. That can be a bit confusing. Sometimes we don't want to even show them the, the, the existence of a, of a um, question unless we have to, um, even if it's uh, you know, in the flow of the survey. So here we can create a new page and uh, we're gonna drag an audio text uh, question on here. This allows the participant to fill it out either with text or audio. And we'll say, please indicate the other sort of protective behavior you used, right? You applied, okay, um, or you undertook. And so they can choose whether to fill out text or audio for this. So maybe if there's someone who, who doesn't feel comfortable typing the response out, they can just record it, right? Um, as some of our studies have done. And here, instead of having a survey enabled, excuse me, a, a question enabled, given a response here, remember this? When we set yes, we said, if this is the answer, enable question five, and we had disabled question five here. Instead, we're gonna enable this whole page um, in order to, uh, based on the response to an earlier question, okay? So specifically, we're going to enable this only if they've answered other, okay, um, uh, here for, for question two, okay? So um, here we're going to say Q2. Why do I say Q2? It's this one here. And I'll say if it equals uh, answer six, okay? Um, so for now, I'll assume if they say other, that's the only answer they're going to get, okay? Um, great. Um, so, uh, this is going to enable this whole page. I'm selecting the page as a whole, okay? Um, uh, great. Um, so do you see what I've done? I've set the whole page to be enabled or disabled based on the answer to question two, okay? Um, okay. Um, okay, uh, great. And I'm going to validate this, and it says everything looks good, and I will now publish it, okay? So essentially there's a page that exists here that will only be shown in the event that they have selected uh, the other, okay? Um, uh, as the, the response to question two. Um, uh, and we can push it to the phone, right? So if you go look at your phone, uh, you should be able to see that you've gotten that response, okay? Um, so here we're going to go to Ethica, and uh, it's saying, okay, there's a new survey. Sorry, okay, this is an, another study. Um, I don't wanna fill that out right now. Uh, no, okay. I'm gonna say I found a tick, and when I say other, um, uh, I am going to, okay, so I said, do I wanna take a picture? And I say next, and then it's going to say, please indicate the other sort of protective behavior that you applied, and I'm gonna say um, uh, foo barbaz, okay. Uh, or I'm gonna say, um, um, stayed inside, um, staying inside, okay? Um, there we go. And uh, I will submit now. Um, uh, not now. Okay. So now we have a whole page that's included, okay? Um, uh, So did you see that? Yes. The, the page should only, um, uh, should only uh, be shown if they've answered other, okay? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, 
And what we've just seen is we can modify surveys once created very readily, okay? Um, great. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, okay, great. Um, so we've just seen uh, surveys. Um, uh, okay, great. Um, Terrific. So we're going to um, to finish that up. Um, okay. So we've seen Ethica a little bit from the perspective of the participant, from the perspective of, of designing a study. I'd like like to now focus a little bit on uh, on on conducting analyses and um, looking at the data. So if we go to sensor data. We'll actually find here that um, uh, that within the sensor data area, there's certain types of stock data that can be uh, provided. We saw before, before surveys. We could we could fill out um, responses to surveys. We could see how people are responding to our surveys within the system. There's also a response map. This would map out where people are responding to surveys, okay? In this case, um, we have to indicate which survey. Uh, and uh, we did find a survey on the map, but there's one response that didn't contain survey uh, G GPS data. It wasn't able, whoa, sorry. Um, I, I pressed the wrong button here, okay. Uh, it, it didn't include uh, GPS data, so it's not able to show it on the map. So uh, here um, in the surveys area, I did response map. I select one or more participants. I select a survey and I go. And uh, it's warning me that there's at least one survey response where it, it can't figure out where it is because uh, it couldn't find GPS information, which is plausible in a large building like this. But uh, by contrast, three of them it was able to to find and if we zoom in we will find that it is uh, localized uh, right around this point and if we uh, zoom in enough um, at some point we may want to disaggregate and it will show a cluster and it will show for different surveys uh, different responses that were given okay um, great um, uh, Excellent. Um, okay. Um, great. So here we can browse geographically surveys. We can also use geolocation to browse, say for all participants, heat maps of where people have spent their time. Now, in this case, uh, it's less information. It's it's less interesting because there's um, there's only a small region with it within which uh, we've traveled. I'm going to switch to a recent study we ran in another in another city, and uh, which has more participants. This is actually just for a, a recent boot camp we ran. Um, I'm going to show it over a period of time from the study start to uh, to the study end here. Okay. Uh, and it was from June 24th through 26th. And I'm going to show a heat map here. Okay, and this heat map basically is going to summarize um, where people within the study uh, were circulating. And uh, as occasionally happens uh, in, in Chrome, there's, uh, there's sometimes an issue with this. I am going to go over to Firefox and just call this up. I, excuse me. This is um, this is a uh, occasionally realized thing. I'm just going to go to the dashboard and um, uh, we're going to go to that same study and plot it out um, the GPS data. So here we go and uh, sensor data, geolocation. And I will do it for all participants uh, and do it over this period of time. And I'll say apply. 
And actually, I'm going to do it just for myself to, to make sure that uh, maybe that's the issue. Here we go. Okay. Um, so it may have actually been that that's the issue in this other one, too, that it was an issue that there was a participant that couldn't be plotted properly, and it just didn't show any data. But um, no, it's, it's in fact not showing it. So um, I've had better luck with Firefox. But this shows for this participant some aspects of their location over the course of the time period. So they spent significant amounts of time there. By contrast, other participants, like participant one here, um, may have engaged in different um, stays within the city, okay? So this is one way which you can view that data. An alternative way is a temporal view, okay? Um, and this temporal view um, would, um, would basically uh, would, would, uh, allow us to see for a particular participant, how did they go, their two wings and fro wings, how did they move over the course of that time from one place to the other? And you control this with this little slider here. And basically, it allows you to say, okay, you know, let us, at first, um, this participant uh, is down there, uh, I believe it's at the bottom, and then they, they engage in sort of local behavior or their map there, then they come back up to the top there, and they spend some time there, and then they take this other route back home, okay? So in this case, we see uh, the actual movements of a participant over time between different locations. You also see evidence of the fact that Ethica is measuring about once every five minutes for a certain period of time, and so there'll be sometimes gaps um, in, in what it's gotten. So for example, going from here to here, there was a, a tiny bit of, of um, uh, time that elapsed, okay? So this provides a summary of uh, GPS data for a particular participant over time. The other, the other one, which involves um, uh, multiple uh, participants will um, uh, will will be for heat maps. So where they're spending their time, the areas where they're spending the most time. Does that make sense? Okay. Now beyond this, Ethica supports uh, a number of other um, convenient ways to to uh, to analyze data. One of the ways we actually saw very briefly, if you uh, had noticed, in addition to displaying responses here, you can also download. And this is a very popular way to download data, okay? Um, and uh, here, uh, here we can basically download it uh, as a zip file and unzip it to get a spreadsheet compatible file. So I just said to, to download it here, okay? And um, upon doing that, um, I could say download to say CSV or to JSON, um, which uh, you folks will recognize as a uh, popular, uh, popular format for encoding certain types of data. I will go and unzip the survey responses Okay, and um, the survey responses here uh, should be within a, oh, I see, okay. So it's in a thing called responses, okay? Um, a folder called responses within it, there it is. And I can go and I can find for each participant a set of survey responses and, uh, and I can go view those. You'll notice, um, that, uh, so yes, uh, discard, um, uh, no, I don't want to save that, okay, I want to open it. There we go, survey responses, okay. Um, okay, great. Uh, great. Um, okay. Um, so, this is a popular way for, for um, uh, browsing the responses over time from a given participant. 
different columns are different um, uh, questions um, associated with different questions, and the responses to those questions are in a given row, right? It, it indicates uh, when the survey was, uh, was triggered in this case, which in this case is the same as the schedule time, and when it was actually submitted back, when it was completely filled. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and this allows us to, um, to see how long they took to fill it out and how long after from its issuing it filled out was in this duration um, in minutes, okay? Um, and uh, this provides an easy structured way of viewing survey information. Beyond that, over within the, um, within the sensor data area, we can also uh, uh, go and download sensor data, okay? So if I go here, uh, I can go to data export and I can say, for example, I want a new data export I want to download perhaps my pedometer data in a CSV file for participant 2785, let's say, starting from that day to that day, and I can say export. And you'll notice that um, by doing that, it's actually showing this as pending, okay? That's because it's going to take a bit of time to uh, to extract that data, okay? Um, and uh, over time, uh, we might check back, and at some point, that's going to indicate through a solid button that it's available for, for download. Do you see that? So this says download now. So if I go and I download that and I save it here, it can download it to my computer, where then I can go unzip it and analyze it, okay? And this data could then be analyzed in a tool of your choosing, in R or in Python or in, um, in Apache Spark or what have you. So there's a zip file here. Uh, if we were to open up the zip file, it includes a, um, a file. Um, Okay, so this is, uh, perhaps I just downloaded the, the wrong, oh, I just downloaded Bluetooth beacon data, I'm sorry. I should have downloaded the pedometer data here. Um, we'll see the Bluetooth beacon data uh, in a little bit. Okay, so I just downloaded it, and um, actually, it, I think it may be downloading now. Okay, here we go, and, uh, and that's the pedometer. And by opening it up, we can see it's a CSV file. And if we go and we look at the CSV, we'll find that it, it actually has data um, associated with, uh, uh, with the pedometer over time, okay? So again, it, the thing inside of it is called uh, here uh, 237 pedometer, and it's actually a file so it should be uh, here at the top, there it is. And if I go and I open this with LibreOffice, uh, I can say okay. And here it's going to give me my steps over time. You can see me moving back and forth. And it's going to give me the appropriate uh, time associated with that, the device ID. That's for a particular person, you might have multiple devices. Um, and this, this can allow, say, from a wearable associated with the person and from a phone, even from multiple phones or a tablet um, that might be associated with the person. And it can say some other information about this. So over what time range, um, for example, uh, the, um, the information is, is gathered. That's the duration here, okay? Um, so here we can download sensor data via um, those mechanisms. I want to highlight a particular type of sensor data, which I think is of specific interest within the context of this, um, uh, this event, which is um, contact network data, okay? Um, so um, 
in order to do that and, and to do it justice, I need to, to talk a little bit about Ethica's options for recording different types of data sources. Um, I've provided you with these slides. I won't go through them in detail, but um, uh, they, they unpack these various types of data into more uh, specific components. Um, what I want to highlight is beacon data. Okay. Beacon data uses wearable technologies in the form of Bluetooth low energy beacons to discover nearby objects, participants, um, locations, or other components. Um, and this takes advantage of the fact that Bluetooth beacons are a widely supported technology that's available in a wide variety of, of form factors. So if we go to, for example, uh, contact.io, which is one of the recommended um, um, Bluetooth beacon suppliers, uh, and you go and you were to look at their um, store, for example, here, um, you'll find beacons in a wide variety of form factors, okay? Oh. These are beacons that speak different protocols, um, but these two speak um, the um, uh, specific type of protocol which Ethica, the particular dialect which Ethica can, can read, and they're very easy to configure. So you configure them in a tag sort of way with bracelets, or you can use them in, in, in ways that are suitable for outdoor use, okay? Um, beacons can be very, very useful for multiple reasons. To keep track, for example, of our exposures. How much time are we spending near the TV? How much time are we spending with a child or with a, um, uh, with a service dog? How much time are we spending near a certain resource, like a prosthetic limb, for example? We can mark these things with beacons in a way that will allow us to, to measure from a phone our proximity and our exposure to those over time, how far we're located and, um, and the duration of that exposure. Um, we can also use them for mobile um, uh, objects. So like card tags, you can put on a lanyard and have people um, walk with them, consenting individuals in the course of a, of a healthcare facility, for example. And Ethica supports uh, contact.io beacons, which are, are, are very powerful and uh, beacons from a manufacturer known as, as Gimbal, okay? I think it's G-I-M, uh, G-I-M-B-A-L uh, beacons, um, which are uh, another manufacturer that, um, that provides uh, different uh, beacon form factors, okay? Um, and uh, these beacons uh, can be used uh, as part of Ethica studies in some very, um, in some very flexible ways. So you'll see a bunch of different beacon types here. We've used uh, quite a few of these. Okay, um, these are supported by the Android and iOS versions of, of Ethica. Um, and uh, basically uh, you can collect them uh, every five minutes for one minute, how long, how far are they away, etc. cetera. And um, those two manufacturers, Gimbal, and uh, contact.io are particularly easy to configure, okay? You can easily configure them for, for use with Ethica, okay? Um, and there's a signal strength indicator called the RSSI, which is Receive Signal Strength Indicator that will indicate how far or close you are. If the RSSI is higher, it indicates you're closer to the beacon. If it's lower, it indicates you're further. And confusingly, um, uh, RSSI is typically negative. So something that's not very negative, like minus one, minus two, minus three, is very close. If it's something like minus 50, that's further away. Minus 70 is even further away. Okay, so the lower it is, the, the, the further it is. Okay, um, and, um, and these beacons, um, some allow sticking on things, some are worn, some are placed on objects. Um, 
We've had dogs carrying them around their, with their collars. And, um, and then we track them. And I want to give you a sense of how, how we can use that data within Ethica. So I'm going to go back to this other study that I was using on um, this boot camp study here. And I'm going to point out that in the data export area, we can request a new data export and we can select, for example, Bluetooth beacon download. And we can do so in CSV form or we can do so in a GFXX form, okay? So I'm going to first select uh, CSV. I'll do so for uh, one participant here. And I will um, uh, say I'm going to export it. And once again, it says starting it and over time, um, this downloads button will become um, gray, it will become black, which indicates that it's ready for downloading, okay? Um, and I suspect that will happen more or less immediately here. And uh, I'm going to download it uh, right, um, it's this one here, download. Okay, so this is a CSV version for those interested in network data, okay? Um, and I'm sorry, I need to get to my downloads folder. Here we go. And if I go and I look, I can see this is a CSV file. Um, and I will extract it here, and there we go. And I will go open it within within um, my uh, edit my uh, my spreadsheet of choice. And you'll notice here that there's successive records for a uh, particular participant. That's the user ID indicating um, the uh, you know, what what is being detected. These are beacons that are being carried by other uh, people at this boot camp. This is a beacon which has been named after the, um, um, the, the Ethica uh, creator here. This is a beacon marking location. And you can see when they were detected and you can see what was the signal strength associated with them, okay? Um, and more than that, you can mark what's called the team ID and subject ID, um, which are, are associated with, with the beacons. You specify a role ID. For example, there could be um, uh, a, a role associated with uh, professor and student, for example. You might have the same team, so a professor and their students, the research lab, but different roles within the team. And you can actually have uh, subjects. So within a team, maybe the multiple graduate students, they're all in the role of a graduate student. Um, uh, they have different subject IDs, the different graduate students, but they're all on the same team. Maybe there's another lab that has a different team ID, but you have the same basic structure. And you can configure these, and in videos you'll find on the Ethica website, there's guidance in a video form of how to configure these. So this is one way to view the information is that a CSV file, and you could load it into an analysis package of your choice, but I wanna show you another way, okay? And that's actually one I've, I've pre-configured. It's with this GS, uh, GEXF, which is a Gephi format, okay? Are, have you heard of Gephi? Is that, is that familiar? Okay, it's a package for browsing network data, okay? And I'm going to call it up right now, okay? This is an open source package for network data. I'm calling up Gephi. You don't have to do this, but I will. And I'm going to go here to my downloads area, and uh, I'm going to find uh, the appropriate Gephi file, and I'm going to uh, get it loaded, okay? Um, and my recollection was, okay, so um, I should uh, remember this. I'll just go and and load it in here. Um, it's the type of file that I would uh, download. And by loading it in, um, it displays a graph here, okay? Um, and this Gephi graph will actually display within uh, its context a set of information about the different users. So you can see this, for example, is user 2785. That person happens to be, if you recall, me. Okay, 
And uh, over here, by contrast, is a different user, 33771 uh, or 3951, et cetera. So each of these people, each of these uh, nodes represents a person. Um, uh, and each of those persons is connected with the others by connections. But this is summarized over the length of the study. Okay? Maybe we're interested in understanding the temporal aspects of this, how it changes over time. Okay? So uh, in order to see this, I would like to go to, um, uh, to take a look at uh, uh, some other features of Gephi. So uh, specifically, I'd like to go down here and enable the, um, uh, the timeline, okay? So with a timeline, I can see over what period of time this data has been collected. And I'm actually going to go and restrict this to a smaller period of time. Okay, so I can only, I'll only be viewing a small window of time at once. And specifically, they're the same participants, but there's different links between them because only some were in proximity at that time. And if I go drag this around, you'll see at different times, there were different networks applying. So this might have been a time, for example, where people were in their hotel. There were a couple of people who were close enough to each other to be co-detected, um, but even then only episodically. But then it, they all came together in the classroom and they were together for a while. Maybe some went to lunch and uh, then there was some time after hours. And you'll notice that um, I'm dragging it over different windows of time and it's updating. Alternatively, I could go through and I could animate it and it will show over time how this network played out, okay? Um, the periods of time during which um, uh, different, uh, different connections uh, were made. So this um, dynamic range is specified in here. Gephi allows for many other features. For example, you can label the, the users uh, associated with things. We can uh, make the connections uh, stronger or less strong. We can also go and compute statistics, say um, a shortest path between components. Um, we can also go and grab particular components and, and arrange it as we see fit, or we can go and lay it out um, in, a, in a fashion of our choosing. We can also, for example, stop this and, um, and uh, run it uh, in a way that performs a different layout. So Gephi is a tool that allows you to explore the network side of data from Ethica in a sophisticated way. It's not the only one. We'll actually see in just a few minutes how we can use a built-in system with Ethica called Kibana and its close cousin Vega to display Ethica data where Vega is used for network data. Okay, and I've actually provided you scripts for this. But Gephi is a very convenient way to undertake these analysis. It can also uh, allow you to undertake many classic types of analytics. For example, uh, associated with uh, degree distributions are associated with shortest paths and um, you can simply calculate the degree distributions associated with some of the attributes. You can compute you know, the network diameter, for example, or you can compute uh, clustering coefficients, et cetera. Okay? So if you want to take Ethica data and analyze it more richly, Gephi is a good choice if it's network data. And it takes into account that it's network data over time. Over time, take into account that certain, uh, certain of the, um, uh, of the uh, connections apply at some times and not at others, okay? I won't dwell on that, but Gephi is a, is a powerful package for network-based analysis of Ethica data. Okay, um, heading back to Ethica though, I'm excited to show you a couple of additional features of Ethica 
that allow us to to analyze data okay um, and specifically I'm going to be showing you features associated with something down here you may see it in your your systems that's called Kibana K-I-B-A-N-A -A. do you see that okay I'm gonna go down and 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 actually I'm sorry before I click on Kibana I want to check out a little bit of information just to set myself up well okay first I'd like to go to the study as a whole and just check its oops I, I should be showing this one I'm gonna go to the study we created in its design I'm gonna click basics and I'm gonna remember its study number I'm gonna to need to remember this okay so you can go and remember your study number and secondly I'd like to remember our survey number okay um, so if we go to surveys and we look at our surveys each survey has a number associated with it and I'm going to enter that number it's 4225 okay for for this survey report tick I'm going to be asking questions about answers to this survey and I want to know what it is okay um, and similarly for the study ID in um, I want to remember that it's study 800 so I can enter that within the context of um, of Kibana having done that I'm going to go to Kibana and I press that button and it's going to bring me to a quite different interface that's linked to Ethica behind the scenes okay And this is the Kibana interface. Kibana is a sophisticated system for visualizing data from Ethica in a quite simple way and keeping those visualizations updated as new Ethica data comes in. It's further a platform for sharing those visualizations with others. So you can actually engage in sharing of visualizations you've created as they keep on coming in a for example a dashboard and that dashboard could be your survey dashboard that all the researchers for a study for a given study come and refer to and it will kind of plot out study specific metrics associated with that study how people are answering surveys or how many steps they're getting for example or the contact patterns coming from that survey we're going to look at the Ethica, uh, the Kibana interface and some of its basics, okay? The first item of business here, when you go to Kibana, first study, you want to go to the workspaces area and associate it with a specific workspace. So, uh, so Kibana has workspaces, and you want to be clear, are you operating in terms of a workspace for one study or another or your own personal workspace your personal workspace might include analyses or visualizations for many different studies but only you can see them by contrast if you have a shared workspace you can see mine and I can see yours and and that's study specific okay so we're gonna have here uh, available workspaces we're gonna have a, a, a workspace for this study and I'm gonna go down and select it it's called dot cabana under bar Ethica study 800 N notice that these are roughly sorted lexicographically and so I'm gonna go down and select mine okay I do that by clicking on it it doesn't show an obvious thing but if you go up to the top it'll now say the current workspace is Ethica study 800 okay Okay, so I just determined my workspace. If I come back here later, I believe it would actually stick. So I have to be conscious, like which survey or which study am I analyzing right now? And remember to make sure I'm in the right workspace. Next, I'm going to go to, this is only something you have to do the first time. I'm going to go to management, okay? Management is used the first time you're doing this analysis with respect to a specific study to set up the, the um, information for that study 
to undertake certain types of visualizations. Specifically, I have to set up what's called an index pattern, okay? And this establishes indices. This is based on uh, Elasticsearch, if you've ever heard of that, and, and it's an index-based system. So I'm going to say create index pattern. There was actually a thing before here, so I'm saying something like indices. And I'm going to define the index pattern, okay? So um, I am going to uh, choose ES800 pedometer. Here we go. ES800 pedometer. It gives some suggestions, okay? And, and I'm going to say next step. And then it says, what's your time filter? And I'm going to say, my time filter should be in terms of record under bar time. Okay, so how did I do this? I went to management and then there's something that said something about indices and I pushed that button. I think it said like indices and I said create index pattern and and then that asked me what what I want to enter and I entered the name of the particular index I want to create. This would be your study. ES is elastic search and yours would be the number of your study. So maybe your study 802 in which case you do ES802 under bar whatever sensor and it, and it gave you a list of possible ones, right? Um, so um, if you want to see all of those that are possible, you could do star here and it will show all of them, okay? So I want an ES800 pedometer and I want to do next step and then it's asking me, what's your time filter? Well, it turns out in elastic or in in um, uh, Kibana, time filtering will be very important, okay? So we want to specify here the time filter um, um, field name, okay? Um, and so I'm going to select record time. Need any help or extra time? Okay, so I'm selecting record time. Okay, this is going to allow me essentially to say, I want to show data from the past week, or I want to show data from the past month. I want to show data for this period of time. It needs to know, how do I judge if a record is from the last week or the last month? This record time is how Ethica data specifically is marked for being from a particular time. Now I'm going to say create index pattern, okay? I just said create index pattern. And it's told me what's in the index pattern, and, um, and, and I'm going to be able to use that. And you'll notice it appears here. Do you see that? It appears in this index. I'm going to create another one. I might as well create a couple of them, okay? And the one that interests me the most is actually survey responses here, um, because I'm going to do some, um, some analysis with respect to that. And so I'm going to go, I just went and copied it with my mouse like this, copied it, and I'm going to go paste it up there. Okay, I'm going to go next step. And, and what's, what's the one? Well, it's going to be record time as well. Okay, resp time is like how long they took to respond. Um, uh, record time is, I think, when it was filled out. Um, I, I'm just going to use that. Okay, um, I created it. Okay. Now I have two of these, and I can go on and create more, but let's, let's uh, deal with those. Uh, actually, I'll do one more, okay? I'm gonna do GPS. Create index pattern, and it's gonna create it, and I'm going to do GPS, ES800 GPS. That will allow me to create maps within this, and so on, custom maps. And I'm gonna say next step, and what do I wanna choose? Record time. Ladies and gentlemen, record time, record time, record time. Okay? Okay? So now we have three indices. And we are ready to get on the road. Okay? Okay. Um, I would note that if we've done that, and we want to look up at what the structure of those records are, we could actually look at what, what's in these, these types of data sources. So for example, for the pedometer, what do I actually get? I, I, 
I have observations here shown over time. And you'll notice time is shown in this x-axis. Do you see that? The x-axis up there? See this? Um, there's time. And you'll notice it's getting different records. And those records are marked as to the type of information. So for example, here, user 2785 and study 800 with this device at 1335, which was uh, just a few minutes ago here, um, uh, they um, took zero steps. <laughs> okay, I gotta get, I gotta get active here, right? Um, and um, it was taken with the pedometer and um, uh, there was um, very little information, so like very little distance uh, travel. Okay, um, so this is recent data. You notice they're going back in terms of time, and over time, data like this will be accumulated, right? So as time goes on, and we're in this room, new data is going to appear here, and that data may show additional characteristics. Uh, we could alternatively go and, uh, for example, go to the survey responses. And um, you'll notice it says no responses have been found. And ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the most important practical uses or practical things or tips I can give you. When you are using Kibana, go frequently look in the upper right, and it will tell you over what period of time are you summarizing data? So this says the last 15 minutes. And so not surprisingly, I haven't filled them out in the past 15 minutes. If I say the last four hours, ah, here are all my survey, um, uh, survey responses. Yes, same thing in the pedometer, right? Um, here uh, here I'm, I'm, I'm just showing things from whatever this period of time is. And I can ask it to do it for longer periods of time, summarize them for longer periods of time, or summarize them for less long periods of time. Okay. Um, so uh, here we can update Ethica data um, uh, over time, and it can respond. And oh, lo, lo and behold, look at this. Um, uh, here I have some more data that's just uh, come in from the past. Um, the past few minutes, okay? Okay, so let's let's go and, uh, so this provides us with a way of browsing the, the responses, which is useful to understand what they look like. But I'd like to go and visualize this data if we could. Is that okay? Um, so, um, oh, no wonder I've been getting zero steps. It's been recorded from my phone and my phone's been sitting, <laughs> been sitting there. I should be, carrying my phone around, right? Um, so it's not really representative for me. I don't, didn't have my uh, wristband device um, associated with me here. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go to visualizations and we're gonna create a couple visualizations in Kibana for this study. Remember, we're in the workspace for this specific study, okay? So I'm gonna go create a visualization and the visualization that I'm going to create is going to be the most basic one, okay? It's going to be a pie chart. And what I'm going to use for the pie chart is the survey responses, okay? How did I do that? Let me, let me go retrace that, okay? So I went visualize, I did plus to create a visualization, I chose pie chart. You notice there's a wide variety of types, including maps, including bar charts and heat maps and area uh, line. I'm gonna choose pi and I'm gonna choose survey responses, okay? Now, the survey responses here, um, I am going to go set the survey ID here, okay? Um, I'm gonna need to, to tell it what survey am I doing this for? And the survey I'm going to, to do it for is going to be 4225, okay? Um, and that will be with a filter, okay? Because I don't want to mix and match my different surveys. So I'll say survey ID here. You notice it allows me to, to pick it. Survey ID is, and again, it's, it's um, it was two, 
4225, uh, 4225, okay? I'm going to say, do it with that. Um, you notice this is saying the last four hours. And now we're going to be um, uh, going and, uh, and uh, we're going to set a particular question ID. So the question ID is going to be determined by this uh, QID here, okay? QID. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to set it to be two. I happen to remember two was the question asking about what sort of personal protective behavior I was engaged in. I don't know if you remember that. I could say like hat or, or sock, it's tucking my things into my socks. So I'm going to say QID is two. Okay, and I'm going to further here split by slice, okay? And I'm going to um, have aggregation over terms. So in other words, I'll cluster things if they have the same answer. And uh, for the field, I'm going to do answer content dot raw. So what did I do? I left the metrics to be the count. I want to count the number of things that share certain terms. That's why it's aggregation terms. And, and what types of things am I aggregating over? Well, it's the answer contents and it's the raw answer contents, okay? And if I say this, you'll notice that now it shows me a pie chart, okay? And these different slices of pie are indicating the different answers that someone could have made. So this is avoiding contact with vegetation and tall grasses. This is wearing a hat. This is other. This is wearing long sleeves. So this is a pie chart, and it actually tells me the count, right? This was one, this was three, this was two, this was two, and this was one, okay? So it's telling me the number of answers of a given sort to question two, that's what this thing is on survey 4225. Does that make sense? I'm sorry? Uh, for field, I did, I picked answer underbar content dot raw. Mm -hmm. And uh, for aggregation, I selected terms. In other words, Based on if terms, if it's the same term, we're going to aggregate so the units will be specific terms. They'll be these terms, and for each of them, we'll have the count of them. Um, there'll be these other terms, and for each of those, will be the counts. And the terms are defined by the answer contents. So um, avoiding contact with vegetation and tall grasses is one answer. This is another answer, wearing a hat. This is uh, another answer, other, uh, wearing long sleeves. Does that make sense? So any questions about that that I could, that I can answer before we go into a new visualization? So I'll call this answer pie chart, okay? There we go. So that's one visualization. I don't know if you've used Tableau at all, but this is quite similar to Tableau conceptually. You're specifying sort of dimensions and what to aggregate over and over what periods of time in this case. Here it's, it's, it's more specific to, to over time. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do. Yeah. Yeah. So what is unique about this one? Okay, great question. We've done a lot of analysis of Ethica data using Tableau, for example, and we still do. We do a tremendous amount of Ethica data analysis with uh, Tableau, with Python, with uh, Spark, Apache Spark. Um, uh, these are very, and, and with R, these are very useful platforms. Um, and you, you're encouraged to do that. It's, it, where it's a good tool for the job, you know, you can use that where people know it. The difference with Kibana is that for all those other tools, at one level or another, they need to um, 
be told where the data lives and, and often it's extracted. So you download data and put it into Tableau as a file, for example, um, or similarly with R. Apache Spark is a little bit different because with a Cassandra connector, it can directly connect to the Ethica database. And we do a lot of that. But Kibana is directly connected with the Ethica database. And this can all be done through the Ethica website. And you can share these, like this, this pie chart. I can then share with others in my team of researchers. And other researchers in my team for that study can then access it. Does that make sense? So it's integrated with Ethica's database and, it's, and, and therefore it can be very fast because it's operating directly off the database. I don't have to go through export and I can share it with others who are associated with the team in a way that kind of provides um, part of the study output is, is in Kibana. So people can go to Kibana, what are called dashboards and and see these visualizations on an ongoing basis. And this is automatically updated over time as new data comes in. And so um, when you, for example, share it, you can share a snapshot like as it is now or, or a saved object, which you know, can then update over time as new data comes in. And if you come back to this visualization, it will show it to you as it is tomorrow or the next day. And I could set it, you know, do this over the past uh, year or do it over the past, you know, the last five years or whatever, and, and it'll be updated over time. So having that ability to keep track of new data coming in, share it with team members, and to have the analysis done very quickly because it's tied in with the Ethica database efficiently are some of the things that mean Kibana can be uh, at least a quite useful tool in the toolbox. You know, it's not the only one. It's not even the primary one we use, but it's a tool that also is approachable by many health scientists. So they can go and create these things, whereas maybe they would find it harder to um, even to go through the process of downloading data, loading it into Tableau. It's a kind of multi-step thing, whereas here it's right there and they can modify it and so on. So that's an, another component. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Good question. They have to be uh, a, stud, uh, a researcher. Uh, they have to have a researcher account, and um, and you have to uh, share it with them. Um, but the plan is to allow for some studies. This is not quite the case yet, but. For some studies, we might actually want participants to have access, um, or those associated with participants. Like maybe this is a, this is a, that we're using Ethica to support children with autism, and we want their parents to be able to see their child's movement patterns. How much physical activity are they getting? Are they getting out of the house? Are they socializing? Um, you know, how much sedentary behavior are they getting versus active behavior? Um, these are questions a parent might want to ask as a participant who are par partner with the child. And so we're interested in using tools like Kibana to communicate in a visual fashion as part of the platform some of these study-specific considerations. And so here is where you can craft these study-specific instruments, put them in dashboards, and have them interacted with. And I think it won't be long before participants can interact with this, is, is I, I think the plan for where it's going. Okay. Um, good question. Let's, let's explore, if we could, a few more visualizations. Um, just so you can you can see some of the diversity. So I'd like to go back and add, by the way, you, you can save it. I, I had saved it um, before here. Um, um, there we go. Um, and I'm going to go back to visualize. And I'm going to add in a new visualization. This one will be a tag cloud. OK? And I'm going to show tags of responses. Oh, this one, not all that we'll do, but this one too, is survey responses. Okay, So I just added in survey responses 
as, as the thing that I'm going to be operating, the index I'm going to be operating on. Okay. Now, um, so the table to use is, is survey responses. Um, I am going to go once again and add a filter. So um, the study ID it was 4225, as is, is I recall. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, this is where I, I say um, it's not study ID, it's survey ID. Sorry. Survey ID is 4225. Uh, by the way, another thing I will say about this, it's very interactive, like you can restrict how much time, what participants you're looking at, um, and it can be very flexible in response. And I'm going to add a filter again, which would be based on question two. Okay, um, uh, and uh, here we go. Um, question ID is, and I'm going to say, um, um, question ID is question two. Okay. Otherwise, it will jumble things from many questions. Boom. Okay. Great. Having done that, I'm going to, in the buckets, choose tags. Okay. Um, and uh, and uh, I click on that. And on aggregation, once again, terms. And for terms, once again, answer content raw. And if I do that, I can go see it displayed as a tag cloud, right? Um, and once again, this is something that can be updated over time. So this will be uh, uh, answer uh, tag cloud, right? Um, and uh, that allows us to, to browse um, or to, to see a summary. Um, of, of different uh, answers, okay? Um, if, we on, if we only wanted to see those for the surveys answered in the past hour, we could easily do so uh, as a user by, by changing things, okay? Um, uh, so that's a, another type of visualization. I'd like to, to talk about a different one. Okay, do you wanna go on to the next? I can, I can do one more? Or do you need a bit of time? Or help? Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, did you do it? Uh, this okay, yeah. Okay, okay. Tell you what, um, why don't you remove the two filters? You can remove them or disable them by if you, if you do uh, uncheck here, you could do it. Um, for for all, um, do you see anything then? I'm I'm wondering if the problem could be in the filter. Okay, what's the time frame? Uh, okay, have you could you set it to be uh, uh, something else like in the past day, just in case it's more than an hour ago? Or last 12 hours, last 24 hours, something like that. Okay, anything? Okay, um, I will, um, I will have to look at that. And it's ESS 800, or sorry, it's survey responses, right? You're, you're doing, um, and uh, you have the buckets. Did you do split slices? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, wait. I'm looking. Oh, this is this is odd. Um, I, I'm looking back at the other one. Sorry. Answer tag cloud. Sorry. Uh, for this one, uh, buckets. It's the buckets, right? Um, so it's tag size and tags here. Um, I would, what's the, the, the tag size? Is it count? Tag size, um, yeah. So are you having anything on this slide or no? Okay, I would have to look at this. Um, so metric, uh, oh, that's order by. I think you are, um, okay. So I didn't order by 
anything but that. Um, okay, the buckets. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, tags, uh, terms, insert content bra. Um, I'm wondering if. Um, okay, let's just let's just try this. Um, no. Okay. So last seven days. Uh, refresh. No. And this is study. Uh, uh, yes. Eight oh two. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm -hmm. Tell you what. Let me. Let me. Uh, I'll. I'll take a look at this okay. next. Yeah. And. Um, and see if we can figure that out. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to do one more visualization, which is important because it's not about survey data. It's about other types of data. Okay. Um, and specifically, we're going to do a histogram of step counts over time. Okay. So I'm going to go to visualize and I'm going to go look at uh, uh, vertical bar and I'm going to do pedometer. Okay. So how did I do that? I went to visualize, I added a new one, and I said vertical bar, and I'm gonna do pedometer, okay? And the pedometer, what I'm going to do here is quite different. So for the y-axis, instead of count, I want to instead choose, how did I do that? I, I use this little, little thing here. I'm gonna choose average. Okay. Next, for the xx, oh, sorry, average of, and I'm going to pull down, and I'm going to say of steps. Okay. For the x-axis here, I'm going to choose date histogram and for the field I'm going to choose record time okay um, and I'm going to leave the interval to be auto okay and this is summarized over a, a period that's unnecessarily long I'll do last 30 days okay I'm going to display here, okay? Oh, you know what? This is only this study. So um, I'm going to say the last four hours here, okay? Um, and, uh, okay, so record time. And so why, okay, there we, there we are, okay? It's showing me record time per five minutes, uh, but this is only uh, okay, so this is over the last uh, four hours. So where are my steps? Um, that's what I'd like to know. Uh, so, okay, this would be a, a date histogram with record time. Yeah. Um, and I don't see any problem with that. Um, oh, the interval. Okay. Ah, okay. Okay, okay. Um, and then custom, no, okay. Yeah, I don't, uh, okay. So I'm going to say count um, for this just to see. Ah, okay. So this is a count of pedometer data. Um, but if I say the average, and I say the average of steps, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing, oh, you know what? The average must be zero <laughs> because I'm not carrying the phone. Okay, okay, well, that's, uh, that's unfortunate. It's uh, showing me to be insufficiently active. I should really carry this thing around and engage in um, some behavior with it. So here, if we looked at count here, this would actually show me the count of records over time, which I garnered uh, for pedometer in the past bunch of hours. And, and basically, um, for different periods of time, 
um, you can see there's uh, different numbers of, of counts. I can also zoom in by selecting certain periods of time. I can go um, zoom in on, on how many records were received for particular time periods, okay? Um, and uh, by browsing over it, I can, I can see some specific information. The interval, we can also set it to be uh, quite specific. So for example, we, we could say every, um, I'm gonna say custom, and let's say every five minutes, okay, um, that I'm going to summarize it. Here, every five minutes, it can summarize for me the, um, the information uh, gathered, okay? Um, and this is counts. Uh, that are received, okay? Um, you can also see something about um, the, the recency of the data that, that it's received. Um, so this data is being garnered uh, over time from my phone. Uh, it's something which um, it will summarize it uh, as new data comes in and in order to display uh, a different window of time, you have to you want to go up here, and you want to choose a window of time um, uh, that that's appropriate. So you could say, okay, come on, um, and uh, uh, you could say, for example, on, on the quick thing in the past four hours ago, we'll go back to to that. Okay. Um, so uh, this data uh, is just from 1605. I was hoping that maybe it would show some sort of uh, extra uh, activity over time. And maybe uh, as, as uh, time uh, progresses, I can uh, carry the phone in. A, ah, here we go. There I am. Now I started carrying the phone and it's throwing. OK, finally, I'm getting some steps. And finally getting some steps, okay? So these are some visualizations. This is actually step count over time. Uh, and um, that, uh, that illustrates some of the, um, the uses of Kibana to display sensor data, okay? Um, in a very simple way. Okay, um, time is counting down. And I want to get you um, uh, a few high-level points um, uh, with respect to this. Um, there's a lot here. There's a lot of additional things we could go into. Um, but there's, there's certain high-level points I'd like you to carry away from this about a platform like this, about mobile data collection, about collection of data from wearables and smartphones. Well, I should note on the wearable front, Ethica supports um, a growing number of wearables. Uh, its most notable support is uh, with Google Fit family of products. Um, and you could have uh, individuals carrying phones and carrying wearables, potentially multiple types of wearables, and it will cross-link all that data for a given person across their survey responses, their phone data, their, their, their wearable data, in a fashion that allows you to exploit it and to use Ethica to store, store that cross-link data. Um, the primary way in which it does it for wearables is um, wearable data predominantly is uploaded to um, the manufacturer's website. So if I have a Fitbit, it goes to Fitbit. If I have an Apple Watch, it goes to Apple. If I have a Google device, often it goes to Google Fit. If you have an Empatica device, like with heart rate, um, they claim heart rate variability. We found it pretty spotty, but uh, EDA, electrodermal activity, that data goes to their website, and then Ethica reads it in from their website, okay? So perhaps once a day, it'll take that data down. So, so Ethica then has data on sleep patterns. Ethica has data on you know, heart rate over time as garnered from these external websites, okay? Um, so that's an, another important part of Ethica's growing platform. Um, one thing I haven't shown you also, um, 
but it's just being rolled out is um, the plan is, especially given the growing use of wearables, someone who uses Ethica shouldn't have to have the app as part of the plan. So if someone doesn't want to install the app or they switch phones during the study, their old phone had the app, the new one doesn't, um, they can still answer questions via the web. And if they prefer to answer it with a browser, they can do so. And even on their phone, maybe they prefer to use a browser to fill them out rather than having an app installed. Um, and that's OK. Um, and in the meantime, they could be carrying wearables, and the wearable data could be providing a lot of sensor data for them. Their, their self-responses could come via surveys. And this is part of a general plan for Ethica to move away from app reliance to more flexible um, interactions with the participant. Another example of this is sending the participant SMS messages rather than forcing them to respond to in-app notifications. Right now, Ethica makes heavy use of in-app notifications. Those are great, but if you don't have the app installed, or people prefer to fill out their surveys on their laptop or desktop, as a lot of older people do, um, where the, you know, they, their eyes uh, can better accommodate it um, and they don't have trouble typing, um, why not send them an email message which says, just click here to fill out your survey? Or an SMS message for those who are mobile um, uh, mobile philic, but, um, but don't want to necessarily have an app. And they can click on that message and they can fill out in a browser if desired. Yeah? So it's only the device ID that changes for a particular user? Good question. Yeah, so a user can have multiple device IDs over the course of a study. And it's not unusual at all for a study to have a given user switch devices or even to have parallel devices. Like maybe I'm, I want to have an iPad and an iPhone and at different times I'll fill it out with different devices. And exactly as you said, um, it will associate with that self-report a different uh, device ID code and it will indicate on what device this was filled out, which might be important for usability purposes or whatever, you know. Maybe people aren't as likely to fill out completely a survey if it's on, an, if it's on a phone compared to a, an iPad. Um, and you could look at the records and find information like that. Um, good question. Yes, you can find duplicates, duplicate records if the person has filled out, um, you know, unnecessarily a survey of multiple devices or something like that. But I think Ethica tries to avoid that. Like, if the survey has been filled out already on your iPhone, say your baseline survey, then you're not going to be able to typically fill it out with your uh, iPad, for example. However, as you can imagine, once you think about Ethica support for offline behavior, suppose your iPad, you know, you had it um, when the survey was issued, but then you go offline, you're using it in an airplane, and you go to fill out that survey. Um, it doesn't know that already you filled it out, you know, on your, your phone um, uh, earlier, you know, also fill it out on your phone. It doesn't know that. So, there has to be a little bit of tolerance for a bit of um, duplication there if you're to allow for offline use. Yeah. So um, uh, that's some of the complications that come in in being robust there. So broadly speaking, and I won't belabor this point, but I want to leave with some um, high-level points. For years, particularly within the health space, but more broadly in human behavior space, We've had challenges collecting reliable data on certain important types of influences, behaviors, exposures um, that people encounter. Um, aspects of people's location often exhibit big differences between what they self-report, where they spend time, and where they actually do. We've known for decades since the Haynes 3 study, there's big differences between physical activity self-reported by a person and what's measured with accelerometers and more recently with heart rate uh, measurements. P 
people often overstate their physical activity and, and they have trouble remembering it over long periods and it's distorted. Nutritional intake, um, uh, burdensome to report with traditional measures and often big differences between what people report over the past 30 days between what they actually do. Um, uh, spatial proximity, we found, um, you know, asking people to report who they've been near for transmission of infection is actually very unreliable and very burdensome, we found in our studies of infectious disease transmission. So aspects of social context, and, and you can go on. And at the same time, traditional survey data is becoming increasingly hard to secure because amongst other things, calling people at home to do a random telephone survey just tends not to work that well now. So many people screen out the calls, and those who don't tend to be of a certain older demographic that you get very biased responses and you have to go through a whole lot of work to get um, a, a smaller set of, of, of samples, uh, and it's very expensive. And I argue that, that smartphones have this unique position straddling the physical world on the one hand and the electronic world on the other. Um, we use them as useful tools for interacting with a participant, for, for getting survey responses and so on. And they can be very good because they follow people around and we can, they can use them at their convenience to fill out that survey when they're in line at the checkout counter or at the bank or what have you. And, and we can, we can um, use them fruitfully because they can take pictures for their surveys or we can show them pictures in their survey, show them videos, or, or gather audio. Those are useful things. But one of the most valuable things about, about um, these smartphones is they, they have this unique position. So we can do intelligent things like trigger the surveys based on where they are or who they're with, uh, when they're with the service dog, or when they haven't been with the service dog for a long time, when they're at a doctor's office, for example. Meanwhile, um, we can label the surveys with that contextual information, right? That this was filled out here. This was filled out at this time, and, and we know from their GPS data where they were or directly on the survey. And we know from other data, perhaps, who they were with at the time or how much physical activity they had gotten before they filled that out. At the same time, these, sense, these smartphones are straddling into this electronic world. Increasingly, our lives, I don't need to tell young people like you this, our lives are mirrored in this electronic world. When we're sick, there's a footprint of that or a shadow of that, evidence of that cast into the electronic world. Maybe we send a Twitter message or we, we update our Facebook account to mention you know, that we're ill or we post a message uh, on, on um, a platform um, that we're involved in. Um, we might additionally, for example, uh, send Snapchat messages which, which tell, you know, indicate something about our, our health state or our location or our mood, et cetera, right? So much of SVP is about making sense of that information. And indeed, smartphones provide the portal or the window into that. And in as much as the smartphones can keep track of incoming calls, outgoing SMS messages, and vice versa, which apps you're using, how much screen time you're using, and with ethic extensions that I haven't talked about, uh, track things like browsing behavior, what sites you're going to, um, the smart, often Ethica can get a glimpse of behavior in the electronic world as it, as it hints as to a person's health status, for example, or health beliefs, or, and so on. If they're going to YouTube videos that are, um, that are vaccine skeptic or what have you. At the same time, the electronic world is a big influence in our day-to-day -day lives. What we read about online shapes our behavior. We read about an, an outbreak and we, we, uh, that affects our beliefs about uh, the priority of getting our, our kids immunized. 
The smartphone also straddles this other world. And the smartphone, in addition to picking up many things, the electronic world, app use, it can pick up browsing behavior, incoming messages, uh, uh, at screen time. It also can pick up for us aspects of our physical surrounds. Our levels of physical activity can pick up aspects of our exposure in terms of our movement patterns to things like billboards, advertising, tobacco, um, to our social context in terms of networks, um, using Bluetooth beacons, or, or in, in contexts where we might be uh, interested in contact patterns as evidenced by location. So here, the smartphone um, can capture aspects of that context and using pictures and so on can document it especially clearly, like cases of vandalism or, or uh, poorly maintained sidewalks or discouraged physical activity or poorly lit streets that lead to safety concerns. And so the smartphone, in terms of a data collection tool, clues us in to a lot of the things that, that are that clue us into evidence of our underlying health state. Um, for example, if we're home for multiple days in a row, it might clue us into we're feeling depressed or feeling sick, uh, et cetera. At the same time, it picks up our exposures to areas, which clue us in to influences on us, like billboards, like poor quality environment for physical activity, or, or uh, heavy uh, junk food rich um, food environment. So smartphones provide this, this straddling between the worlds of all these hints as to our underlying health situation and all these influences on that health situation over time. In a tool like Ethica, by, by linking up pieces of data concerning this external physical world, where you are, who you're with, you know, what sort of physical activity you're getting, or sedentary behavior, um, aspects of your, your social, uh, social surrounds and aspects of your, um, your movement patterns. At the same time, doing it for the electronic world uh, can be a very powerful tool for health understanding by cluing us in to all these influences and all these clues as to our uh, underlying understanding. I listed here, but we don't have time to go through, a variety of need, of, of key needs for, for motivating use of a tool like Ethica. One of them, and the most basic, is for more accurate, lower burden self-reporting. With a tool like Ethica, we don't have to ask where people are geographically, because we can measure it. We don't have to ask aspects of who they're with among other study participants, because we can measure it using Bluetooth beacons. We don't have to ask how long it's been since you were with your dog, or since you've been outside, because we can measure it. We, we actually can know from the data on um, how much physical activity you've been getting recently. We don't have to depend on very sketchy self-report. We can have it through aspects of sensors. Right? Um, so this is a major need, but self-reporting we can do on the phone in a way that a picture tells a thousand words to. That photo of a rash or of a tick can tell so much more about what they were exposed to or their symptoms than just you know, a few lines of, of written information in a diary. At the same time, another big motivation is, is for, for use of these is to assess outcomes, um, including uh, outcomes along different pathways. Tra with, traditional, with traditional tools, we often have to take an intervention and we only understand a small piece of it. Here with phones, it gives us an understanding over time, almost a biography of what's been going on across many aspects of a person's situation. And by cross-linking with other data, say occurrences of levels of pollution within the ocean as measured by municipal sensing, sensing and, and sampling, um, or information on when a beach was closed, for example, or Think about my geographic location and cross-linking that with particulate information for that region of the city, for example. We can capture information over time on exposures and then, in a very lightweight way, through the phone, 
information on symptoms and sort of how someone's feeling, right? That someone has highly credible gastrointestinal illness at a certain point. And we know something about what they've been exposed to, their history over recent time. Um, similarly, for something like tick-borne illness, you know, that if they can be interacting with you to report certain things, we know when they were outside, when they removed a tick, when they, when they uh, had a rash appear, we can ask them questions or we can have them proactively self-report it with those buttons we saw. Um, and this is particularly true when we intervene in a situation and we can see how does, say, training with a highly trained service dog that can interrupt post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, how does that affect their social engagement, their time outside, their degree of sedentary behavior, of moderate to vigorous physical activity, their, their flashback episodes. We can get evidence of this through the phone by asking questions combined with physical measurements, like are they outside or inside, or what's their physical activity level? Or ask them to take a photo of a pharmaceutical, right? Um, um, we can keep track of where they've been and spending their time and what their exposures are. You know, if there's a tobacco billboard here, we know lots of the participants have gone by their day in and day out, and we can look at those participants. How does it affect their likelihood of quitting cigarettes over the course of, of their study? Um, one of the biggest uses for this is learning from interventions. And I would argue that with a tool like Ethica, if you use it, when there's an intervention in place, you can understand much more deeply why you see certain effects and along what pathways you've changed things. With traditional instruments, if we consider a complex intervention like moving a family to a mixed income neighborhood for a poor income neighborhood, often we're focused on very rough outcome measures like the, how did it change obesity over a two year time period. And we don't necessarily know why did it change obesity. Was it um, because people were out walking more? Because the, it was a safer neighborhood? Is it um, they had greater access to recreational space? They had greater access to ball courts and, and fields for, for recreation than the old neighborhood? Or, or was the obesity reduced because they were getting access to, to healthy foods in the new environment in ways that they only had convenience stores before. Um, maybe it was due to aspects of, of uh, spending more time at home and eating home cooking rather than spending time out with friends at, at restaurants in the old neighborhood. You, you could create all sorts of hypotheses, but if you're depending on self-report you know, once a year, often your ability to resolve these is pretty limited. You know, asking how often did you go out to eat in the past year? Or, or how often were you outside walking uh, in the evening hours? Whereas with smartphones, we can actually start to measure things along these different pathways, these generative pathways. We can actually look at how much physical activity are they actually getting? Are they spending time in recreational areas? Are they engaged in walking at different times during the day? Are they really going to the food stores a lot more, the healthy food stores, than they did in their old neighborhood? And we can start to piece out why we see changes to the obesity levels. Um, which of these factors are really driving those changes and which are, which are sort of side players even working at cross purposes for the improvements, not, not, um, not enhancing them. So these, these smartphone-based uh, data collection tools give us a pulse on why we see certain results. Um, and by implication, if we didn't get the, all the results we were hoping, why not? And how can we improve it? Instead of just saying this intervention is not effective, we can say, why was it not effective in this context, and how can we do better by, by studying these pathways? This works very well with simulation models, I should say. It's highly compatible, and that's one of the key pairings that I don't have time to talk about today, but, but it's behind the scenes here. Um, uh, so these, these um, uh, additional components um, that are picked up by smartphones can also be used to clarify aspects of choice and under what conditions people undertake activities. They can show patterns that are just not obvious through self-reporting and with traditional instruments. For example, here showing very long episodes of vaping, shown in red here, 
compared to smoking shown in, in these sort of grayish purple colors over time. Um, you're, when you're picking up micro behaviors, behaviors at a smaller scale, sometimes you can see patterns you just wouldn't see through self-reporting once a month. You know, about how often did you vape? How often did you smoke? You might answer that, but what you can pick up is, wait, the periods of vaping are much, much longer than the periods of smoking because you're getting vaping um, in context and, and at a finer grain level. You can pick up where people were smoking and vaping or you know, what prompted them to, to, to smoke an e-cigarette on the phone. You could, might be able to gather this in a way that just is not plausible to gather you know, a month hence or two months hence retrospectively. Um, and you can look at where they use them uh, as well. Um, uh, and the, the final thing uh, I'll just say is so much of, of our influences, particularly in youth these days, come through the device. The device is this window into this electronic world, which influence youth in large ways, whether it's through screen exposure or apps that they're using, the browsing that they do, um, or they're keeping track of their daily physical activity routine, um, uh, monitoring how many steps a day they're getting on the pedometer, et cetera. Um, the devices often play a really big role. And we can use smartphones to give a window into this world, um, uh, to give an, an understanding of how they're circulating in the e-world and in the physical world to get this, this picture of the underlying situation. And this sort of information can be used by the person themselves in their informal care network, their caregivers, um, for clinical management, a, a, a doctor, a clinician, a nurse, um, uh, for health service delivery, um, running a more efficient hospital, knowing when people are waiting for certain resources or how much time they're spending on certain tasks without burdening them and reporting it. Um, at the public health level for prioritizing testing or better, more quickly identifying outbreaks um, by allowing people to report illness who don't see the doctor but, but feel ill. And finally, for strategic decision making, particularly when linked up with, um, with dynamic models. So smartphones, by straddling these worlds, form this particularly powerful nexus of data collection. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the nexus that, um, that Ethica is seeking to address with this increasingly sophisticated platform that we've seen here today, okay? So I'm gonna leave you uh, with those thoughts. I'd be glad to answer uh, further questions, but I'm honored by your presence here. And I hope that this presentation has given you some direct exposure to this platform um, and uh, some sense of where it's going uh, in future months, but also some sense of what you can do with it and its degree of flexibility for addressing many types of needs when it comes to understanding human health behaviors. I further hope that it's given you some appreciation for where smartphone-based data collection fits in to understanding aspects of human behavior um, both in terms of the activities in the daily world as well as this whole digital world that is a shadow of our daily world but also influences us so much these days. So thank you very much.